And now we arrive to the last of our guest. Our guest is a ICREA researcher also. He, he was born in Belgium, but he developed most of his career in the United States. Finally, he arrived to Catalonia almost six years ago, and he is a biolinguistics ec expert. Welcome, Cedric Borix. <laughs> Let me start by uh, thanking you, Patricia, for the opportunity to tell you a little bit wha about what I do, what we are interested in, uh, in solving as problems. I don't think that I deserve the title creator, but for a living, I build bridges, not bridges where people can you know, actually travel on, but where ideas can travel on. And the ideas are supposed to link different disciplines. I moved to Catalonia about uh, six years ago from the United States with a PhD in uh, linguistics under my arms. And if you hear that, you suspect that I'm interested in languages. <laughs> and actually, I'm not. Uh, uh, linguistics is many things, but for me, it's a discipline that asks one of the most fascinating questions about human nature. It asks, how come we have this ability, and perhaps not even this ability, this necessity or this reflex to spontaneously acquire at least one language in our life? If everything goes right, if there is nothing strange in the environment, we'll be able to acquire the language spoken around us. And many people, beginning with philosophers and now um, more with, uh, with hardcore scientists, believe that this is actually telling us something about what makes us human. And that's the question that I'm interested in. But to solve this question, we have to go a little bit beyond philosophy. We have to go a little bit beyond what uh, linguists are doing. We have to actually combine the insights from various disciplines. In particular, we have to take really very seriously uh, the many results that biologists are providing us about what makes us human. And so what we try to do, and I say we because I'm not alone in this enterprise, what we try to do is, is if you want to act as translators, we try to listen to all sides, to all different disciplines, and to tr try to create a common language that will enable those very insights to actually converge on an interesting um, hypothesis that we can then test, or several hypotheses that we can then test. And I think there's never been a better time um, to actually do this sort of combination between a field like linguistics and a big field like biology, hence the term biolinguistics. It's this attempt to try to take advantage of all the recent findings in the various disciplines and, and also appreciate the complexity of each of these disciplines. If there is one breakthrough that I want to mention, it's the ability that uh, Svante Pabo and other people since then have, have um, actually created, namely this ability to retrieve ancient uh, genetic information from bones. Traditionally, people thought that we cannot say much about human cognition, the human mind, language, from the bones. They are silent, there is no recording, forget about them. Until actually people uh, managed to retrieve genetic information from those bones, and then they enabled us to ask another question, namely, if we have that information about the can we actually move from, take that information and actually build an inferential process from the genes to what actually creates the modern mind, namely cognition. And in order to do that, we have to study the brain. We have to understand the relationship between genes, brains, and eventually language or cognition more generally. 
So we have to link various bits and pieces of a big puzzle coming from genetics, coming from neuroscience, coming from linguistics, coming from archaeology, link bones, genes, brains, and come up with an answer that makes sense for everyone. And so we inhabit uh, a field that sort of sits in, in the middle, that's at the crossroads of various disciplines, and looks at language and cognition pretty much like uh, Gaudi saw or created a mosaic, different bits and pieces that we have to put together to create a pattern that makes sense. And so I came to an institution like ICREA because that institution defines itself as an institution without walls. And I thought it was a perfect environment to start building bridges. So this is why uh, we do the work we do here. Thank you. So, great. So, mm -hmm. Come here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you were um, first, as you said, um, working in the US. That's correct. Where were you working? Um, well, I moved from Belgium uh, when I was 20, I uh, got my PhD in Connecticut in the United States, and then a few years after that, I uh, taught at Harvard for uh, six years. So I'm from that? And then from Harvard, I moved to uh, Barcelona. To Barcelona. And here, how, how is your work environment? I mean, your, your team? The, the, team, the team is, is sort of twofold. There is a very small nucleus of, of brilliant students that work with me uh, that are interested in uh, the same questions. And that's, that nucleus um, connects uh, with the various experts that we find in Barcelona. We find great people in um, genomics, in neuroscience, in uh, archaeology, and we try to get um, to understand from them the sort of complexity and uh, nature of their findings. And then we put all those findings together and try to put forth something that, you know, uh, a story that makes sense for everyone. I find that very difficult. I mean, complex, I mean, challenging. Because when I was reading mm -hmm. the article you mm -hmm. sent me, it fascinated me the, what you were explaining about the language-ready brain that mm -hmm. we have. We, mm -hmm. are, we come with that built in when we are born, the That's modern correct. human. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about that. It's, uh, it's true that it's complex because um, students who are interested in this field uh, don't have to become an expert in just one discipline. They have to become an expert in at least two, but potentially three or four. Um, but you know, it's, it's also, that complexity is also richness. It's just like when you learn different languages or different cultures, I think you become a richer person by just gaining that knowledge from various uh, sources. And likewise, in academia, well, you can do uh, this sort of thing that people call interdisciplinarity, that makes you uh, not an expert in one thing, but um, uh, a, a bridge builder. Right? And so one thing we, we've known for quite a while is that humans are special in, unlike even our closest relatives, in this ability to acquire the language of the environment as a reflex. See, if I put um, another species next to me and I'm raised with that uh, animal, I will acquire the language of the environment, but that species will not. It will do many, many interesting things that I will not be able to do, but language will be this one thing that will characterize us. And so it looks like, as a child, our brain is so, sort of ready to soak in the language of the environment. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand what it is about our biology that, that makes it possible. That's the puzzle. So other thing that caught my attention was the fact that I, I never thought that, that our anatomy mm. or the globularity of what you were talking mm. would determine the capacity of acquiring the language because it would mean that somebody finding the bone mm. would really infer that the language could be or could not be acquired. Well, this is actually a specific hypothesis that, that we have been exploring for a couple of years. It turns out that we have lots of um, uh, information about skulls from you know, uh, anatomically modern humans, but also 
um, you know, closely related species that disappeared, and also living species. And it turned out that when you look at the skulls, you see uh, differences, and in fact, those skulls are used to define some species as anatomically modern or not. Mm -hmm. And so we came up with this idea of trying to understand how come the skull acquires the shape that it does. And in, there is a particular period in your life where the main factor driving the shape of your skull is actually the brain that grows inside it. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that you can actually understand quite a bit about brain growth by just figuring out how the skull forms in the first year of life. But in the first year of life, it's not that your brain develops and your skull forms. There's also a wonderful thing that happens, namely uh, children start acquiring their, uh, their language. So in that period of time, brain growth also correlates with the first steps of language acquisition. And so we are trying to come up with a hypothesis that links these things, namely how the brain grows, how it reacts to the environment to acquire language, and eventually how we could use skulls to derive information about what sort of brain it takes to actually be ready for the language of the environment. The question that I would have is what is first? Because I mean, also the environmental input is very important too to, for the development of mm -hmm. the brain and the growth of the brain and the growth of the brain also shapes the, the skull. So when did it start? What is first? <laughs> what is the, what? What it's, as usual, the answer to that complex question is yes. Uh, <laughs> namely, uh, everything has to happen together. But there is one thing that I, I'd like to add. You're right that the environment is also particularly important for, for the brain to actually derive its information. But it's also true that um, it's in part our biology that determines the environment that we actually create. So we are a remarkably social species and cooperative species, unlike many other uh, closely re uh, rel related uh, species. That too is part of our um, biology. That is, there must have been changes uh, at the level of the genes or even more complex levels of description that made it possible for us to start cooperating and build the environment that we are building, that makes, the in part, to, yeah. um, you know, the, the right context for language to emerge. So it's very complex. So there is no single factor that you can, you know, highlight at the expense of the others. You have to juggle with all these balls in your hands all the time. And also, other interesting thing is how having this globularity, this uh, special mm -hmm. shape, mm -hmm. also determines the way it, the brain computes or the, the right. information. The the, it, it's correct. See, there is one thing that's, that's remarkable that I think many people can uh, sympathize with, is that we know of many people, unfortunately, that suffer from uh, uh, mental disorders. And many of um, these um, uh, people, these individuals that you can see, actually look quite different. They have uh, facial yeah, type. um, types that are distinct from the norm. Even though everyone is sort of different, you recognize immediately someone with, say, Down syndrome, for example. And um, this sort of uh, facial phenotype, and also their uh, skull phenotype, um, is actually d dictated by the fact that their brains grow differently. And that will determine, actually, also their mental profile. And so we try to understand how this sort of hypothesis that we are interested in at the level of evolution could actually tell us something at the clinical level. That is, could we actually understand why these people tend to have problems with language or with, our, with other aspects of cognition if we can actually link the information from genes, the information from brain growth, and skull shape. And could we, or are we close to determine the set of genes that determine that, or, or are we far from that? Uh, I, you'll get a different answer from me depending on the day. If I feel good, I'll say we're very close. <laughs> uh, if I don't feel so good, we are very far. No, I think that um, we have a couple of candidates, but 
there are so many more uh, that we need to discover. I mean, even those candidates that we understand best, we only understand a fraction of actually their nature. So if we have maybe five or six candidates at this point, or maybe 10 or 20, we have to realize that probably there's going to be a thousand or two thousand candidates at the end. So that gives us, um, you know, a sort of perspective. Uh, we have to be modest about the results that we can also get. But at the same time, it's a good argument for recruiting young people because we need all the help that we yes, can get. It is an uh, exciting time this, this century when we are just so close. That's right. I think that there's never been a time where people had as much information as now. See, this, this word that many people like to use called big data, where lots of disciplines are gathering huge amount of data. And that's great, that's very useful. But in addition to big data, you need big theory to understand yeah. that data. And so there's never been as good a time as now to actually link this massive information to yield understanding. That is to turn the facts into knowledge and to transfer them to the community, to society. And then, of course, return. And you have done a lot in that sense, because I remember when I asked you, have you how many books have you written? Mm. And even you were saying you are not a creator, your mm. answer was between 15 and 20. No, I said too many. That was my oh. answer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's yes. correct. That is, that's a big output, I mean, the production of books. It, it comes with the fact that, you know, the work we do is made possible through directly or indirectly society. And uh, even if we do basic sciences, we have to make sure that we uh, give back the sort of knowledge that we have acquired in a way that uh, people are able to, to appreciate. And it doesn't have to be extremely applied results. I mean, lots of people are interested in just understanding things better. And, uh, well, if I can contribute to that a little by writing books, why not? That's also some, something that makes us human. I mean, that characterizes our species. It's, it's this uh, curiosity that we have uh, that, uh, well, you know, is, is, is also at least part of the problem. See, when, uh, when I said that linguists aren't just working on languages, they are also interested in phenomena like creativity, like curiosity, all these things um, that... Music as language. That's right. Um, music creators, um, creating mathematics, creating tons of systems that other species that are otherwise extremely intelligent don't, you know, don't think about. And so that's, uh, that's what we look at. So that's so interesting. What you do is so interesting that we will need another program to continue talking <laughs> and also talk about this thing I read in your blog. Mm. What is your blog just for people to... to, to well, we have a, a group um, that's called the Biolinguistics Initiative Barcelona. And uh, we decided that the best way to convey our results or activities is to actually follow uh, through a blog. And so I invite you all to take a look. So and this group is called Biolinguistics Initiative Barcelona. It's very easy to find. And uh, you will find uh, what we do. Thank you very much, Thank you. Cedric. Mm. Thank you.